everyone, I'm Chanley Painter with Court TV and I've been talking to True Crime Rocket Science. Hello and welcome to True Crime Rocket Science, the most authentic voice in true crime. Do you mind if I share my thoughts and insights on Roberto Laundrie's letter? Because I do have a few. Can I just add that while many of you were preoccupied with the Laurie Vallow case or the Letitia Stork trial, I was literally walking in the footsteps of Gabby Petito's Instagram. I mean, it's one of the reasons I came to America. Um, I've stood in the exact spot of the Moab stop. You may remember that I exhaustively dealt with the Moab stop in, in excruciating detail. I've eaten several times at the Moonflower Co-op. I've stood under the delicate arch, which ended up being Gabby's profile picture on Instagram. I visited the salt flats outside Salt Lake City, where Gabby and Brian filmed their van for their one and only YouTube video. I visited the Grand Tetons and the Merry Piglets, where Gabby spent her final hours. It's part of the reason, as I say, I came to America, to, to feel my way through the Petito case in particular, but also as a way of getting to know your America. And I don't know if you can come to a case stone cold. I don't know if you can come to any case stone cold and decide you know it, you know, when you were last immersed in it months ago. It takes kind of a while to warm up. Do you agree with that? And so sometimes it sort of feels like, you know, we were all focused on the Laurie Vallow case or this case or that case. And then something happens in the Gabby Petito case and it's like, well, we – Instantly experts again because we we covered it some time ago. Anyway, I'm looking forward to sharing my many notes and sentiments that have accumulated while following Gabby and Brian's van life journey over the past several weeks. But before we get to that, I want to deal with um, a couple of issues and a couple of sort of ideas related to this letter from Roberto Laundrie. I'm going to give you my take on it. and But then some other other sort of aspects that have sort of occurred to me sort of in general. But before we get to that, if you haven't subscribed to this channel, please do. If you're interested in following my journey day to day in America, I'm, I'm sort of putting up content on Patreon, I put up sort of uh, audio diaries every day, and then also uh, members-only videos on the in the members-only section of YouTube. So that's where the sort of content is, the, the daily content. Right now, I'm in Indianapolis this weekend, and well, yeah, this weekend it's the Indy 500. If you're enjoying this episode, please like, share, leave a comment. You can also hit the thanks button, and let's get started. So I'm going to deal with Roberta Laundrie's letter. And, and it's, what's quite interesting is there's something similar going on, a similar thing that is going on in the Brian Koberger case that is a, really a test of critical thinking. In this, in this case, in terms of the letter, we want to look, look at the relationship between context and insight. So when you know the inside outs of a case, the context – that's really when the insights flow, when you can kind of make kind of snap judgments. When you don't know the context that well, then you can kind of have a situation of um, the Dunning-Kruger effect. That, that's that sort of scenario where a person with a fairly low level of knowledge on a subject tends to assess their knowledge as greater than it actually is. Where, where conversely, experts on a subject may either underestimate their knowledge or tend to be careful expressing it, knowing they, that there are certain subtleties. And so that's really something I've been really wanting to share with you guys, um, you know, the subtleties of Gabby's van life journey that you can't otherwise um, sort of, what's the word, into it without actually being on the road every single day and without going to many of these places day after day after day. I remember um, thinking when I was dealing with the Gabby Petito case, wouldn't that be fun to be doing what they were doing? And so I've actually been driving nonstop for weeks. And right now, life's starting to feel like a series of national parks. 
and if not camping sites as it was in Gabby Petito's experience, then hotels and airports and an endless series of rental cars. Just yesterday, I was at the Great Sand Dunes National Park and bizarrely, there was a white Ford Transit van just like theirs, but minus the ladder, coming in to the parking area and parking just as I left. My point is, if you want to figure out what's really going on in, for example, Roberta's note, you've got to spend a little time in her shoes. And part of that means trying to get to know Brian a little better. You know, if you know Brian, you, you know his mother to some extent, because it's a case of like mother, like son. And you've got to spend a little bit of time uh, doing that, not just looking at the note and, and making your decision that way. Does that make sense? Now, as a way to illustrate what I'm talking about, consider the idea of performing an autopsy without evidence, which is exactly what they're sort of doing in the, the, um, the Dana, Dana Smithers case. And I want to talk about that case after this video in a separate analysis. But you had the same thing with J.J. Vallo. When after he was exhumed, there was very little evidence, you know, tissues that remained intact because there was a lot of decomposed tissue. But based on the plastic bags, what they inferred circumstantially was that he may have been suffocated. That's an okay inference to make, but technically, that's really just an educated but still very weak evidential argument for what really happened, right? So what I want to say is that in true crime, the central piece of ev when the central piece of evidence is missing, one does have to extrapolate or interpret, but you've got to be careful doing that, right? And in this case, we're dealing with a letter with no date. And I think one's got to really be conscious of that. So there's a quote here from a guy called Yudowski who says, studying biases can in fact make you more vulnerable to overconfidence and confirmation bias as you come to see the influence of cognitive biases all around you in everyone but yourself, right? So even as I'm somewhat aware of biases in true crime, I've got to be careful that I'm not biased myself. And that sort of brings us to this idea of what was Roberta's bias? What was her motive in releasing the letter, right? She released the letter to the media, not the Petitos, not Nicole Schmidt. So when they've been private all along, why did they do that? And so we know from Nicole Schmidt's statement that she said the letter was not released to the press by us. It is interesting that she would do this now, given that she has resisted providing it for the last five to six months. And then she asked for a protective order, asked for a confidentiality agreement uh, in the afternoon of May 24, 2023, which is just a couple of days ago, and then released it later that day, right? That's according to the Petito and Schmidt uh, statement. Now, I think that the reason the Laundries um, released it, in, this is just my opinion, was to try to regain control of the narrative. I, I could also, uh, sorry, it could also have been done to prevent the Petitos from trying to profit from using the letter, for example, I guess in a documentary. I don't really know what the reason is, but I think it is interesting. Like why did the, uh, you know, you kind of get that feeling that the laundries wanted to um, not give any benefit to the Petitos. I have uh, experience uh, doing forensic examinations on letters and notes, such as the, Ram the Ramsey Ransom note. In order to do that, you want to look at factors like the length of the note, the timing of the note, the tone of the note, handwriting analysis and other idiosyncrasies. And if in certain areas you don't have some of that, so we don't have the timing of it, what we do otherwise have is the length. We've got a little drawing on it. We've, we've got some of these other things. But, you know, even if you kind of know what you're talking about, Roberta provides basically the key aspect that we needed to look for in when she makes the statement. She said, I ask that you read it in its entirety. In other words, don't handpick little statements in it. And then she says, and understand that the letter contains other phrases besides those highlighted uh, for sensationalism, etc. And you know, I'm, I'm the first person to say that letter doesn't reflect very well 
on Roberta, on the laundries. It doesn't reflect very well. It doesn't make them look good. It doesn't make her look like a good mother, right? But the statement that she's referring to is, she says, if you fly to the moon, I will be watching the skies for your re-entry. If you say you hate my guts, I'll get new guts. And so I think, and, and I know uh, we reflexively want to make this very simple and be very strident in, and, you know, in our response. But I think one's got to look at who is Roberta as a person when we look at this, this ransom note. Also, what kind of guy is Brian Laundry as a person? You might say, I'm not really interested in that. But if you really want to know what the, the intention was of the note and the timing, then you need to ask those questions. And so we know that Brian liked to read. He liked lullaby in particular. The, the bird on the cover of that book is the same bird we see on the cover of Roberta's letter. What does that mean? You may remember when this channel was covering this case, we also covered the Moab stops, as I say, in excruciating detail until no one cared anymore. But we also covered Brian's reading material. I ordered that book, Lullaby. So did some of my other subscribers, mods and so on. They ordered it, read it, reviewed it. Why do we see him posing with certain books, notably by the same author over and over again? What's that all about? Well, I'm not going to bore you with a literature lesson or the finer details and themes behind the books that he was reading like Fight Club and Lullaby. But the point is simply just this, that Brian liked to read. You can see in the van a, a small little library of books. These aren't people just traveling and, you know, and I can tell you I've been traveling through America with four or five books and I've virtually not read a page from any of them. There's one book that I've read a little bit out of, but I can't say I've really um, sat down with, with these books and, and really spent time reading them. I've been running around far too much doing a lot of photography. But you kind of get the sense that Gabby and Brian weren't like that. They would stay in one place for a lot longer. They would absorb things in a lot more peaceful way. But that would could also make it a lot more expensive. The, the longer you are somewhere, the more you've got to, um, you know, survive there. You know, you've got to make food, buy food, and 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 right. But the point is that Brian liked to read. Both Gabby and Brian were creative people, artists with a unique artistic way of expressing themselves. So the van life adventure was part of that artistic way of expressing themselves, and. I think Roberta was trying to key into that. Do you see that? And that brings us to cognitive bias. So when I was in Frederick, Colorado a few days ago, sniffing around, asking questions about the Watts case, a gas station clerk said that the cops initially suspected her daughter was either selling drugs to Chris Watts or sleeping with him just on the basis of them seeing him giving her money on CCTV. No, it turns out he was just trying to get change for a babysitter. You see, this is where the notion of good and evil comes into it. If someone is evil, it means everything they do must be evil. Absolutely everything they do is, e is evil. But you, and you don't need any evidence. You don't need any explanation. You don't need any context. You don't need any argument. It's simple. It's easy. But that's the difference between evil and criminal psychology. Criminal psychology is the process surrounding a person's thought and actions, thoughts and actions within a particular context. Evil is, well, you just fill in the blank for whatever you want to believe about how bad someone is. So I don't know whether the letter was written before or after. I don't know. I can't say. It's undated. So I don't know. But given that we know the end result that Brian murdered Gabby and his folks and their lawyer didn't seem particularly helpful... It seems logical that there would be some sign that they knew something. And, and isn't this letter that? We're looking for a sign, so haven't we found it? Well, just because we want a sign doesn't mean when something is halfway to what we're looking for, we can decide it definitely is that thing. Exactly the same with Dana um, Smithers, right? In the Brian Laundry case, is Brian, sorry, Brian uh, Koberger, is Brian Koberger a serial killer? We, we 
Some people think that he could be or that he should be. Well, isn't this evidence? Well, because I want it to be evidence, it is evidence. No, that's not how evidence works. When you have a hammer in your hand, everything starts to look like a nail, and that's where you've got to look at your own bias. Are you looking at the evidence, or are you looking at um, what something is in itself? In the Scott Peterson case, actually a single hair that maybe belonged to Lacey wasn't enough. There wasn't really enough evidence to convict Scott Peterson. And I don't think it should, it, it should have been enough to convict him. Do I think Scott Peterson was guilty? Yes. Also, the tone of the audio recordings didn't really, there was no confession there, didn't really amount to anything either, where Scott talks to his mistress. That technique wasn't, technically wasn't evidence either. But people did get a sense that he was guilty through that evidence, through sort of by inference. And I think he was guilty. I think he is guilty. And so that evidence was elevated to kind of smoking gun evidence, right? And so in this case, are we trying to elevate evidence to something because we want it to be? I'm not sure it is. Is that what we're doing? So... I have a feeling that this may that there are a couple of reasons why this may have been written before the van life adventure, and I'm going to share what they are. They ordinary reasons. It's not rocket science, really. It's um, a, a couple of reasons why I don't think Roberta would have wrote that kind of that kind of letter after Brian murdered Gabby as a sort of letter of support. And these are the reasons I say this, and I say this as as a writer, as a narrator, someone who's also studied a couple of letters written um, either in jail, you know, as Amanda Knox did, or ransom notes as the Ramses did, um, or love letters as Chris Watts did. I've, I've done quite a lot of studies in that respect. And so the first thing I would look at is tone. Many people have rightly commented that the tone of the letter is weird. But although that's true, are they also seeing that if Roberta thought her son had committed murder and perhaps was about to commit suicide, well, then the tone of the letter would be completely different. It wouldn't be weird. It, it, it's actually just inappropriate. There would be urgency. There would be seriousness. And so that if you fly to the moon, comet is just too flippant under the circumstances. Can you see that? Number two, there's also a reference to time and distance in, in that note. Let's start with the second reference, distance. She says, not time, not miles and miles and miles, right? And so she knew that Brian and Gabby were going to be going away for, I don't know what it would have been, three months, four months, whatever it was, Right. And so she knew he would be far away, and he would be far away for quite a long time. That was the point of the journey. And so I think it's because her son was embarking on a significant journey that she, law that, that she thought a letter was warranted. He wasn't going on a weekend away. Uh, he wasn't going on some sort of getaway locally. You know, there would be no need to write a letter under that sort of situation. She also anticipated that they would be gone for some time, which, of course, they were. And you, you tend to see gestures like this sometimes, um, writing, cards, letters, when someone goes somewhere on a significant journey for a significant length of time. Did she express certain things in a weird way? Yes. But is Brian a kind of an odd duck himself? You know, he doesn't wear shoes, he doesn't like to drink water out of a bottle, a plastic bottle, this, that, and the next thing. And then that brings us to the third point. If Brian had returned and was with Roberta, directly with her, why would she give him a letter, not simply talk to him? Because she assumed, did she do that because she assumed he would go into the swamp? Did he tell her, Mom, I'm going into the swamp? And then would she think, well, he'd be, he'd be in the swamp miles and miles and miles away for a very long time, right? I, I, don't, I, I think she would have said something else, something you know, about we, 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 we're there for you just around the corner, whatever it is. Anyway, she said, 
I did not want anyone else to read the letter, as I know it is not the type of letter a mother writes to her adult son, and I did not want to embarrass mine. I do think in those words she's conceding to some extent that she's molly cod- she she was molly coddling him in that letter and that she's a molly coddler anyway. She, she also said, that is why I wrote burn after reading on the envelope and I knew that Brian would know what that meant. I'm now appreciative that he actually kept it. I, I find it quite interesting how she's quite sensitive to that, sensitive to the fact that Brian kept her note and yet so insensitive to the public wanting to know what happened to Gabby. I find that odd. But also, why is there no appeal if she knew the intimate details to take care of his mental health? She says, instead, remember that love is a verb, not a noun. It's not a thing. It's not words. It's actions. Watch people's actions to know if they love, not their words. That seems to be an awfully neutral, cerebral thing to write if Gabby was already dead. I mean, this seems to be the sort of thing to say to a son who's engaged. You know, something for him to know, but also him to, you know, about himself, but also to know about somebody else. So my impression here was that Brian's mother was aware that Brian could be triggered by words, and she was trying to soothe him and reassure him not to be upset or, or to become too sensitive about words. There's also zero reference to Gabby, which I think is interesting in itself. The last thing I want to say is that the part that I think we should be talking about is that Brian is a mama's boy. And instead of bickering about whether the, the letter was written as a show of support by an evil mother for her evil son, the conversation I think we should be having but aren't is that Brian, if you ask me, was a mama's boy. Besides the murder itself demonstrating that Brian lacked proper emotional depth and security and confidence to deal with trials and tribulations, we know that unemployed, emotional Brian was very much dependent on his folks at the time of the incident. And a dependent kind of person can be in a codependent type of relationship. And you felt that during the Moab stop and, and sort of in other situations that they were in as well. So financially, I think um, it's precisely why someone on the Petito side balked at the idea of the two getting married because Brian wasn't independent. He didn't have a job. I personally see a very clear mirror between Brian's enmeshment with Gabby and his enmeshment with his family. Uh, He's codependent on them, he's codependent on her. And I think this happened, this incident happened because the strong, independent, emotionally mature Brian we see grandstanding in front of the cops, the Moab cops, um, isn't the real Brian. The real Brian has temper tantrums, he's got serious insecurity and control issues. Another key issue with mama's boys is that they are mama's boys to begin with because they've failed to launch socially as well as in a work setting. And this means he's used to being spoiled, he's used to getting the lion's share of attention, he's used to getting his way, he's um, used to getting special treatment from mama. And so when his girlfriend has friends and worse social media and he realizes he isn't the center of the universe and he can't get exactly what he wants, well, what does he do? He lashes out. That is exactly what happened here. Final point in the statement from the Petito family, I think it's interesting that they say a reasonable inference is that the letter was written after Gabby was murdered, murdered, not the reasonable inference. In other words, there's, that there's only one inference. I think there are a couple of inferences. One of them, and it is reasonable, is that it was written after Gabby was murdered. But another reasonable inference was that it was written before. And then the question is, which one is more reasonable? What do you think? Leave your opinion, your, your uh, perspective in the comments. Thank you for listening, and I'll see you guys next time. Thank you.